Hello everyone, this is Take from BigHeadTalker.com and welcome to BHT Studios. I am about to embark upon a very unusual unboxing, which is that of a camera that came out in, well, it came out in 1971. This is a 1975 50th anniversary, uh, Jubilee anniversary edition. And no, it is not the camera that you see right there, which is the classic Leica M3 with a 50 Almar collapsible, but it is that of the, are you guys ready for it? The Leica M5. The much not beloved Leica M5 that many blame for it to have almost bankrupted Leica back in the 70s, which I think is a very oversimplification of what happened with the Leica M5. But uh, nonetheless, this is the infamous or famous, depending on, on your perspective, the Leica M5. And when I was down in San Francisco in September for a work project, uh, I was doing a project with the Leica store in San Francisco. And while there, we noticed a lot of really cool used items and they had many new in box. They had two sealed Leica M6s in box, unopened, untouched. But they also had this very unusual Leica M5 that was also new and in box, but it was not sealed. So for whatever reason throughout its history, uh, the camera store would have opened it for some reason at some point, maybe just to show the customer what's inside, but the camera was never used. And so uh, when I was down there, myself and a couple of my colleagues were very interested and Shubadarshi, which is a colleague of mine, I'll link his uh, Instagram account down below, uh, he decided to buy it. And so thank you, Wayne, of the Leica store for convincing, well, I mean, I don't think he himself was a fan of the M5, but I think he obviously is aware of his historical significance. And he did say this is a very rare camera, although the M6 new in box was also very tempting. But yeah, this is the 50th anniversary, the Jubilee anniversary edition in black and never shot with. And so thank you, Shabadarshi, for letting me do this unboxing video, although I'm sure you really want to go shoot with it. And uh, yeah, let's see what's inside. I mean, when I started, I had the classic M3 because this is this is what started it all. And I kind of want it here the whole time. What, what should I do with it? Should I, should I just leave it here or, you know what? It's too pretty. I think I'm gonna have to pull it off camera and we will start the unboxing of the new inbox, but old like M5 now. All right, let's start with the unboxing. Now it does have the 50th anniversary label there. That's the serial number of the camera. And pretty much um, that right there, I guess the, the 10502 is, is uh, it's probably designating. Can you see that? It's just designating that this is the black edition. And this is uh, still was made in Wetzlar, Germany. Uh, the cameras after that, it took a while before the M's started production back in Germany again. And this was still done in the old way of kind of like, I forgot the term for it, but it's like fit and finish where each camera was individually fitted and checked for. So each part, if it was the tolerance was slightly off, they would just tune it just a little bit so that it was uh, it would work for this particular one, which took longer to build each one. And uh, but many feel that it's more precise in the hand and in the feel. And we'll see if we can feel that difference. But many Leica fans do say that the the original M4, the M5, the M3, the M2 just had a certain feel that the ones that were a little bit more mass produced after that uh, kind of lost that sort of charm and that feel of that old school German craftsmanship. Uh, and this was still built during that time. And so nothing in the lid here. And here is the instruction book. Let's just move all these things off to the side. Now this instruction manual, unlike the new digital ones that are super thick, pretty darn thin. There isn't a lot to this, although this was at the time the most advanced Leica M-Body to date. 
because there was the uh, the Japanese made SLRs that were taken over the photo industry and a lot of the European brands and a lot of the rangefinder cameras were suffering in sales of it uh, because of it. And so the M5 had to catch up. The M4 previous to this did not have TTL, did not have uh, even metering. You know, a lot of the modern features in what was already coming into the SLRs was not coming into the rangefinder cameras. And so this was Leica's attempt to show, to flex their technological muscle, to prove that the rangefinder still had a place in the market. And so this is the um, um, instruction manual. And the first thing you notice is there is a piece of paper here. And what does it say here? Talks about uh, what lenses you can and cannot use on the M5 because the M5 had a, uh, a metering system where a little arm would kind of come down with the little, I think it's an eight millimeter photo uh, diode that came down. And if you had a collapsible lens and a lot of lens backed into it, uh, would actually hit that metering uh, arm. And so a lot of lenses were not, you're not supposed to use them. Here they have the listed here. They're, they're all collapsible. And as well, it talks about some of the wide angle lenses here. You can see the, the 21 mil uh, f4 looks 28 almerit 2.8 35 sumeron so there are other lenses other than the classical that just you should not use with the m5 unless you're super careful and you could tell here they're actually explaining how if you on the collapsibles if you put some kind of a, a strip that didn't allow the lens to collapse in all the way then the lens wouldn't hit uh, the thing. So this is actually it tells you to use this little. What is it call cause it not, call it now? It's um standard embossing tape supplied by the the Dymo firm are used, and so that's what they recommend. But this is the the manual here, and you know these I've seen these manuals before. They're very simple. Uh, gives you explanation of all the parts and what it does, how to hold the camera. One of the things is when you shot with the M5 vertically, I think the the um, the uh, meter didn't work, so you had to make sure that you had to meter horizontally and then shoot vertically, which is kind of an odd thing. And uh, yeah, this is this is it. I'm sure you can find this manual on the on the internet. So I won't go through each page; it'll take a while. But in the at the, I always love the end because it kind of shows you all the different accessories you can get for it. One of it being the Visoflex Three, which converted your rangefinder into an interchange uh, into a I think an SLR which is kind of kind of odd and, and ugly I've never seen anyone shoot it on the street like that comes with the, you can also get it with the bellows you can get a copy stand with it and here are some other cases and enlargers and slide projectors so there you go that's the instruction manual you also get a certification Owner's registry card. And I love these. These are the punch cards. So if you're a kid, you might not know what a punch card was, but this is like the first computers because each punch card was in a certain position that when you put it into the machine, it told the machine probably the serial number and maybe even the dealer and the country of origin. And so if you bought an M5, you'd have to send this in to the head office from North America, which is New Jersey. And I guess you would keep this side here and you mail this in and it says uh, not valid unless mailed within 10 days of purchase. So that's a, a pretty quick turnaround time. As soon as you bought it, they want you to register. So I guess it's too late to do that now. And also looks like it comes with um, a business class, uh, sort of first class uh, mail. So it must be paid for. So you just fill this out. You slip this in here and then you send it off to Leica. And here's a, a letter, and let me see here, dated March 25th, 1975. Uh, subject, anniversary, crama. And this is actually, it's, it's actually to the dealer, look at that. It says, uh, maybe I should just leave it here and you can just read it, do a little screenshot and you can read it. But uh, it's basically talking about cases or something? What does it talks about here? Anyways, you can read it, but I think it's kind of a neat thing to have with your new inbox camera. Now here is, what is this? Okay, so this is, okay, so the the Leica M5 
took an unusual PX625. It was a, a mercury, there was mercury in the battery, mercury sulfide or something like that, or mercury, anyways, it was a, a, yeah, mercury oxide battery, and that was banned in the US, and so there had to be a replacement battery, and here it's the MRB625. It's still a 1.35 volt, and it says zinc, it's, it's a zinc air battery. And so I don't think zinc air is the same as uh, mercury. So this must be the replacement. And there's even a little hole here in the styrofoam where the battery sits in. So that's pretty cool. So that's everything leading up to the camera. So here is this and that. And this is the lid. And I'll just move this all aside. Here we are. This is the new inbox. Never shot with, but it has been open. And this looks like, again, an official uh, box, I mean a bag, because it gives you, again, the serial number, the last three being, it's a 13.5, and then uh, the last three is 7.62. And so this should match up with the uh, serial number on top here, and you can see 1359762. Can you see that? There you go. So that matches up very nicely. And here we go, here is the 50th anniversary. And you can see that there, I guess, Jagre, I, I don't know how to pronounce that. I guess that's German for Jubilee or anniversary or something. And this is the black model. Now, from what I hear, the black was more common than the silver. And I actually do prefer each Leica, depending on which one, um, for the M3, uh, although the M3 black paint is rarer. I do like the classic M3 in the in the uh, the silver finish. But when it comes to the M5, because it's so big, uh, I find that the black makes it look a little bit smaller. It's not smaller, but I mean it just looks a little smaller, doesn't it? Or maybe I'm wrong. But uh, this is it here. And this 50th anniversary, this Jubilee anniversary, 1975, did make it to the Leica CL as well as uh, the M4, because I think I've seen them on eBay before. But this is quite a, a difference, right, from the M3 design, from the classic M design that we were used to from the M3, the M2, and then the M4. And then here came the M5, again, designed to be an SLR killer, or at least an SLR keeping up with the SLRs that were coming out of Japan. And uh, one of the things uh, that they had to add was a quick rewind, which is down here, instead of it being on the top. And according to some historians, they say that it was moved because of the, the more complex, um, the more complex metering system that's in here. So it had to move it from Typically, it would be up here. It's moved it down below here, but I've never heard anyone complain about the position of where this is. Uh, I think it's in a fine spot there. And here, let me just move this box as well. So this is it here. And uh, it does have the um, self-timer here, which was the M5 was the last Leica to have a, a, a self-timer. And then this is the, obviously to see your frame lines, but when you pull it all the way back, it's the way of testing the battery. Now, speaking of the battery, the battery is, there you go. It's on the side here, which to me makes more sense than, I'll just put this down for a second. I have uh, the Leica M7 here, and as well as the M6, they put the battery in the front here, and that's in a really odd spot. We've kind of got used to seeing it, but I think if it was put on the side, it would look nicer, but I understand why they don't put it here, but right there's where uh, the battery is on the M7 as well as the MP and the M4P and any other Leica M film camera that has a battery, but this one had it on its side, which makes sense. And as you look on the side, you can notice that it has these lugs here. Now this was, uh, this is a later model. It originally came as double vertical lug only, and then they came with the third one because everyone complained about it. But you could see that the heights don't line up. Here's the side one, and here's this one here. So they're, they're kind of lopsided, but so you have the choice of going vertical uh, or going the standard way. Um, I personally, do, I actually like the eyelets on the original M and the 
past M's and even like, you know, the newer cameras with like the Fuji films use these eyelets. One of the problems was with working pros, many of them, because these were brass, they did wear them out to the point where it actually got so thin that you needed to replace these lugs. So I do understand why they went with the slit style, but I don't like the straps that come with the slit style, right? You need to, in fact, I think I've, I missed something. I missed something. What, what I missed, um, what I missed was, uh, they always put the strap on the bottom here. So let's just kind of, I'll open it up later. Anyway, so this, this strap came with it and, uh, you know, uh, it's supposed to be, it will last longer. Cause you know, you could tell the lugs are a lot bigger and thicker, but I still, I still like the standard eyelet style like this, right? So this is a, a strap from Barton 1972. And then you just kind of, well, it doesn't fit on this one. It'll fit on. It'll fit on the M3. You could put this on the M3, no problem. All right, so let's kind of go through the M3 again. Um, so you've got the three lugs, you have the self timer, you have the, uh, the frame line selector as well as the battery check. Here is the button you press so that you can uh, put lenses on here. Um, I cannot show you the, um, well, maybe we'll try a little bit later, but w when you, when you, when you cock the shutter like that, what happens is that's when the arm will come down with a little meter that, and, and you can see some YouTubers, I think Mijonju on his M5, and I'll put the link down below. He actually shows the little thing coming down. The way you can show it is if you actually put a M to um, the thread the thread mount adapter, so it actually thinks there's a lens on there, then you can see it coming down. But in general, Leica does not recommend to do that for you to view the arm coming down because it's a very precise mechanical uh, uh, action. And if you hit it by accident or touch it by accident, you can misalign its position. So it's best not to, to uh, try your best not to uh, look at it. So you have that and the viewfinder here is a 0.72, but you, you it starts at 35. So you get 35, 50, 90 and 135, I think. And then you have your range finder viewer, the light accumulator, and you have a, a unique one right there, right there. And that's where you can actually see uh, your shutter speeds uh, inside the viewfinder, which was quite unique for its time. Now from the top, uh, Again, this uh, was at a time where Leica, the quality of build was better than the later Leicas until you got to probably Leica M7, which kind of went back, to, for instance, this is the top and bottom brass. Uh, the M42 and the M4P and the M6s, other than some limited editions, all use some kind of a zinc alloy. This is still a brass, but it is uh, uh, black chrome. So it does have a, a light zinc coating uh, to to keep the bond stronger. So it doesn't brass as nice as black paint, um, but it is engraved here versus stamped, which even my Leica M7 is, is, is all stamped and the M42 and the M4P, a lot of those other than special editions were all uh, stamped, but this is engraved. So it has a nice quality feel to it. Uh, this was the first Leica to have a, 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 a hot shoe. Uh, a lot of them had cold shoe mounts like the M3, but you, it didn't have a sink in the middle, right? You have to actually attach it to the sink cable here or else you can't trigger the flash. This was the first to have that sink. So that's why there's a, the X there, the flash sink X there. And uh, also you did have metering. So uh, a, a lot of the Leicas in the back, you know, this is just so that you can remember what uh, film you had put in here, but it didn't do anything. My Leica M7 does actually do something. This this does have DX coding, and this does actually have exposure compensation, and it has your ISO selector back here if you want to push or pull. This one here, this is also just for memory uh, as well, and you can tell if you have daylight film or tungsten balance film, but here you actually did change the ASA, which is the same numerical value as ISO, and then you have the DIN, which is the German film standard. And as well, what 
made this quite unusual and unique, but also it actually worked really well, but it's kind of ugly, is that the shutter speed dial is wrapped around the shutter button. So you can actually, because you can see the shutter speeds in here, when you're shooting, um, you know, as long as you knew where your apertures were, which way would be to the wide open and which one is stopped down, you can actually see what shutter speed you're at and your metering so you can match the needle so you can make sure you get the right exposure. And so this actually was one of the fastest shooting Leica M's. And like many had said, this is also one of the most stable and quietest of the Leica M's. And I can't confirm if it's the quietest or not. I mean, I can kind of compare against the M3 that I have here, but I need to put a lens. Here, so let me just grab, uh, here, let's just grab a lens here. I'm gonna grab the 21 millimeter here which might be a bit too deep. You know what, I'm scared to put the 21. Maybe I won't put the 21. Let me just grab another lens. Let me grab a, let's grab a 90. So this is an M, M Rorcore 90. So I'll put the M Rorcore 90 on here. And okay, so now let's, let's just listen to that. All right. Now let's listen to the M3. Yeah, it's really subtle. It's really subtle. Definitely quieter and softer. And now it's compared to the M7 here. Oh, the M7 is really quiet though. But mind you, the M7 also is an electronic shutter. Let me just try this here. Yeah, between the M7 and the M5, it's really hard to tell, but with the M3, definitely is is quieter. Uh, and that's kind of what it's renowned for, its quietness and its speed. And definitely this was quite an advanced, uh, advanced range fire compared to the M4, which is pretty much like a, a, a better version of the M, it's like a merging of the M3 and the M2 together is what you got the original M4. And this, because, Again, they were trying to compete against the SLRs that were coming out of Japan that were a lot cheaper with more advanced features. They put a lot of technology into this, but the biggest problem was, again, the aesthetics of how it looked like to most people. And most kind of got used to the silhouette of the Leica M3. And this silhouette went after the M5. It didn't do so well. It went back to the standard silhouette. And this is a Leica, a digital Leica, the M246, the black and white only. And you can sort of see, okay, so there's the M5, and this is the uh, the uh, the original M3. You can really see the, the resemblance. And if you look at the latest Leica M10, you could still see that same design aesthetic that's made its way to even the most modern Leica cameras. And so let's uh, keep on moving here. And the way you, so this is separated here. So that's the rewind knob. And this is what helps open this up here. And you can see this is very, really good condition here. You can tell it's never been used. It's 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 so minty fresh in here. And this did have the, the quick load. So the, the spool stays in here, unlike the M3 and the M2 where you have to take the spool out. And here is the top here. And yeah, it's a little bit dusty in here, but it's been sitting unused for 40 plus years and so uh but it's really it's in really nice condition look at that and the uh black chrome some complain that the black chrome does not wear out as nicely as the black paint and that i will agree i do don't like the look of a black paint when it's new but when it wears out it looks fantastic and so this is the leica m5 uh 50th anniversary edition, uh, love it or hate it, uh, you know, this is what it is. And there are fans of this, uh, of this Leica M5 that love shooting with it. But I do have another surprise for you. So I'll just leave this off the side here, is that I have another copy, another Leica M5, new inbox, but the difference between this one and this one is that, first of all, this is a silver model. And also, although this is new in box and all its paperwork is intact, 
this did have a few rolls go through it, but it's still pretty minty. So let's do a second unboxing now. All right, the second unboxing and like the last one, you can see here there's a serial number. This will end with 039 and it is a 137 beginning and it's 1378. The other one's 1379. So this is actually a newer model. I mean, sorry, an older model. At least it was manufactured a little bit later and it also has the designation here 10501. So 501 probably meaning that it's the silver chrome edition and the silver chrome is the more rare version that you can get versus the black chrome and like the other box unboxing here is the instruction manual in fact this instruction manual looks like it's in a looks like it's in in, in better condition and look look at that this even this catalog it says printed in germany what a weird world it was back then, eh? Where here, even if something is made in Germany, the box is made in China, the printing is done in Brazil, the styrofoam comes from, you know, like it's just global. Where back then, you know, everything was made in Germany, including the, the paperwork that this comes in. There's very few companies that do that nowadays as the world has gone global. Uh, there is an extra sheet of paper in here that actually shows you how to put the strap on, which is very... I mean, I guess if you've never put one on and you're a, a, a ring style lug guy, you would need to be told. And again, here is uh, the same paper that tells you what lenses will not work on here unless you put that tape on there to keep the back of the lens from hitting the, um, the little the swing arm, the little metering arm that comes down. And so again, we won't go through this manual. It looks like it's pretty much the same as the other one. So that's this here. So fantastic. And uh, let's just here. This is another piece of paper. It looks actually it's the letter is actually different here. Uh, May, dated May fourteenth, nineteen seventy five. Anniversary cameras. Here is a shipment containing an anniversary camera, fiftieth crest. This is a special certificate. To receive the certificate, your customer must mail in his registry uh, card. And then this came from Eugene C. Anderick, sales and marketing manager. And so again, confirming that you needed to, to send, you needed to register to get, you know, some extra features here. And this is really nice. This actually has, um, this is the kind of stuff that I love finding in used bookstores. So it looks like it's like a litty, litty, a little miniature, uh, brochure here showing the different things you can get like this is a, a Lysina Super 8 Cine camera look at that and also here's a, a slide slide machine slide projector and here is some Leica uh, Cine cameras and there's uh, some binoculars and here is the there's the M5 there and then there's the Leica Flex, which I was never a fan of. So this is another thing, right? Because of the Japanese SLR craze, uh, not just Japanese, but I mean, it was primarily coming out of Japan. Leica decided that they needed to compete and they came out with their own SLRs. And the successful Leica Rs, at least in my opinion, started with the Leica R4, which was built in collaboration with Minolta, same as the Leica CL and the CLE system. And so there is the Leica CL there. So it's kind of showcasing um, everything that, uh, including enlargers to do your own dark room. So showcasing all their products that they had at the time and they gave you a little brochure. So this is, to me, this is golden. This is the stuff that I love. And, uh, this is kind of unusual here. It actually says not for sale. M5 Chrome gives you the model number. And I don't know why it says not for sale. And it'd be nice to know the history of this camera. And maybe it was a store copy or a museum copy or a collector's copy. And they wanted to make sure that nobody bought this camera. Hence, new in box, uh, but shot with. But everything else is kind of kept pristine. And again, here is the registry card with the serial number. Again, there's holes in here for the punch card so that again, you put it into a machine and it can read all this data of the serial number, maybe what dealer bought it. Uh, but this is all code. This is all kind of old school code, which is fantastic and never sent in. So 
Hence, they didn't get any of that uh, extra swag that Leica would have sent you. And again, here's a, oh look, this is not um, this is not uh, first class mail. It's not prepaid, pre-registered. Look at that. So leave that aside. So that that's what I found really interesting about this uh, silver M5. That extra paperwork, extra brochure, and not for sale on there. And now let's open her up. And here again is um, an unopened. I'm kind of curious. I kind of want to open this, but uh, uh, I don't like these straps anyway. So maybe I won't open them because it has kind of that pleather feel to it. And so we'll see. We'll think about it, right? So let's put that aside. And here we are. This is the silver chrome like a M5. And here there's a serial number. Again, it's a different plastic. It's a different wrap than the one that came with the black one. It's a little bit lighter. Doesn't have um, doesn't have that. Uh, hey man, let's just let's just grab it here. Here we go. This is the plastic. This is the plastic from the black M5, and there's the serial number on there. And this is the plastic from the silver. Feels cheaper and thinner. It's as if they were both made in Germany, but maybe packaged somewhere else. That's my only sort of guess why the. That's different, but that's it. That's everything. And now, now let us look at the M5 in silver chrome. Now let's just put the, um, I'm going to put the um, lens cap back on the M5 black. Just put that back so we can kind of take a look at both of these here. Can you guys see that? So let's let's look at both of these. Which which one do you guys prefer? What do you guys think? I mean, maybe you hate both of them, but if you had to choose one of them, you're stuck on a deserted island, you're forced to shoot with one of these, and you care about how a camera looks. Which which one do you like? I'm still I'm still liking the black, but uh, the silver is is more rare and more valuable, and so uh, what do you think? And the, the, the vulcanite, the covering on this is really nice. It's still both in really good condition. Um, let's just look at from the top here. Um, it does look cleaner. The top looks cleaner in silver chrome, I must admit. And then if you look at the back, uh, from the back, I actually prefer the black because it's so simple up here, right? But on the top here, the black looks a little bit more cluttered. And maybe that's because the writing here, the engraving, uh, the engraving actually looks a little bit different. Like the font is thicker. Can you guys see that? Maybe it's just an illusion, but the 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 lights, Witzler, Germany, in the white on black looks thicker. Like the white paint looks thicker than the black paint, right there. Can you see that on the on the silver top there? But maybe it's just. Maybe it's just an illusion. Even the serial number on the hot shoe looks thicker on the on the on the black model than the silver. But let's talk a little bit about uh, these cameras here. Um, this was a major design change. So let's bring in the other Leicas that I had here. Here's the the classic M3. That uh, it's basically the blueprint for all. Uh, Leica M's other than this one here uh, even the modern digital M's if you notice the M10 has that ISO dial that sort of pops up here and that's really from the original rewind knob that's on the M3 here and here is the uh, another kind of a controversial Leica M which is the M7 which I I love the M7 uh, a couple of reasons one being it has a on and off switch here as well, it has aperture priority with, for some felt it was going too far uh, for Leica because, you know, Leica is about purity and blah, 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 blah. I think they also need to move forward and it's nice to have had the M7 as well as the MP. So if you want to go like fully mechanical, but with a meter, you got the MP. If you want fully mechanical, no meter, you got the MA. And if you want the most advanced Leica M body ever made in history, you get the M7 because there's DX coding, there's there's a auto exposure, aperture priority, there you know you have TTL flash, you have, you have tons of cool features in the Leica M7, but most Leica peers kind of rejected the M7. And of the three, the M7, the MP, and the MA, of course this was just recently discontinued. So there's actually a little bit of 
camaraderie between the Leica M7 and the Leica M5. Although in terms of the silhouette, the M7 is still based on the on the sort of the design aesthetics of the original Leica M3. And so here we are, we have the M7, we have the M3, and we have two Leica M5s. I hope this is straight, I can't really tell. Uh, as well, we do have we do have here a modern uh, digital Leica M body, which is the M246, which is based on the M240, and this is thicker. This is thicker. The new M10 has gotten thinner, I think, close to or the same thickness, uh, same thickness of the original film Leicas. So um, it feels in hand. Like I can tell in hand right away. Like this, this feels like a tank. It feels thick, it, o overly thick. And then when I even feel the M5, it just feels more comfortable in the hand. The thinness of it anyways, it feels more comfortable. So uh, this is more of a comparison here, just looking at at, uh, at all of these. And let's just pull that off here. So what do I think about the M5? I think they're fantastic. If you are looking for an unusual M, an M that has a kind of a funny history, it was introduced in 1971, discontinued in 1975. So it's probably, I think it's the shortest run like an M in history. And uh, only 33,000 or so were sold. And compared to the M3, which had over 200,000, 225,000, I think, close to 225,000 of the M3s, and only 33,000 of the of the M5. And so it shows you that this did not do very well in sales. But because they made only 33,000, it's actually more collectible. So if you like collecting rare Leicas, uh, maybe look for the 50th anniversary three lug like a M3 inbox and uh, find one minty like this and it'll probably only appreciate in value. Um, for me, I also love the M7 for its quirkiness, uh, but most will either pick an M6 uh, TTL or they'll get the Leica MP. But um, you know, all these cameras are really cool and unique. It's fun sort of playing and collecting, but most importantly, shooting with. And so maybe next time what I'll do is I'll have a, a shooting review of the Leica M5. I'll ask uh, Subhadarshi to loan me probably the black one, let him run a few rolls through first, and then loan me the black one. And then I'll compare that against the original M3 and the modern, or the most modern of all the Leica M's, which is the M7. So we have the M3, the M5, and the M7. Thanks for watching and happy shooting.